Thank you. All right. So once again, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with our event now. We're so glad to have you all here in the space with us today and to, excite, uh, and to share our learning with you. Um, so my name is Matt Gustafson. I, my pronouns are he and him. I'm a community organizer and political educator with Somos Mayfair. Um, and I'd like to hand it over to Oscar to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Oscar Quiroz Mandrano. I'm a political education coordinator with Somos, um, with Somos Mayfair. And before we kick it off, just wanna make a quick land acknowledgement. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory, the indigenous people, the Moekma alone, uh, Ma, uh, Rama, Tosh, and Tomesh Nation, of which we are whole learning, working, and organizing today. We are committed to honoring and making this a, a viable, uh, visible the land of uh, the, the visible the indigenous people and tribes that were in, uh, intentionally displaced from their land who remain here in Silicon Valley are a part of our our community. Thank you, Oscar. If you can go to the next slide. So Oscar and I will be your hosts for today. Uh, we also have a few more community members who will help facilitate as well, and you'll meet them with longer introductions in just a few minutes. I do wanna say now that uh, this event is actually part of Silicon Valley's At Homes Affordable Housing Month. And so we're really grateful um, at Somos for SB At Homes partnership and advocacy and all the housing work that, that we're doing uh, together in San Jose. I would like to now invite our friend Kenneth from SB At Home to say a few words about Affordable Housing Month. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Buenas tardes. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this exciting event our partner Somos Mayfair has put together on housing cooperatives. Uh, my name is, again, is Kenneth Rosales. Um, I'm the planning senior associate with Silicon Valley at home, and we're an affordable housing advocacy organization that works across uh, Santa Clara County. Uh, not gonna lie, we were super amped to hear Somos Mayfair would participate in this year's Affordable Housing Month. And yeah, you guessed it, the month of May is Affordable Housing Month. Uh, this is the month where we invite all of our housing partners to host many, many webinars, workshops, and provide opportunities to engage in community to bring housing justice to our region. Uh, this year's theme is Reimagining Home, where we ask all our participants to think unconventionally, deepen their wisdom, and shift the collective paradigm towards building equitable, inclusive, and restorative communities. So please take a peep at our other events for the rest of the month. I'll drop a link. Um, uh, in the chat so you could view all the different events we have going on um, and uh, you know we'll likely drop a link at the end of the event as well so thank you thank you again um, Somos Mayfair for giving me some time to say this piece and uh, everyone else enjoy the event great thank you Kenneth all right next slide please so um this is a friendly space. We want to invite all the rest of everyone who's in the room to introduce yourself briefly in the chat. If you would please put your name and your pronouns and your affiliation, if you're with an organization or if you're a community member who's just interested, um, put that as well. And I'll, I'll read names off as folks jump into the chat. So don't be shy, don't be shy. <laughs> welcome, Chris. Oh, here we come. Anissa, welcome, welcome. Uh, Julie, welcome. Glad to have you. Alejandra, welcome. Maya, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Welcome, Nicole, Carmen, Juan Angel, Janelle, Jeremy, welcome, Ruth, Daisy, Brenda, Imelda. Glad to have you with us today. Maria Teresa, welcome. Domingo, Victor, Gail, welcome to everyone. All right, I know we'll continue to have more folks introducing themselves in the chat. Um, I'd like to move us to a few housekeeping items. So if we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we want this to be a positive learning environment for everyone. And so we have a few agreements just to set the tone for our meeting. Um, number one, we'll ask that you put questions in the chat or hold them until the end. We are gonna have a, a section for Q&A and discussion at the end. Um, number two, that if you're not speaking, we ask that you would put your microphone on mute and keep it on mute. And lastly, 
um, just for your mentality that you would be open to learning from everyone uh, and question the way that things are. I think a lot of the work that we do here at Somos acknowledges that everybody in the space is an expert in a different way and that all the wisdom that we have together is really what what um, makes our uh, our struggle and our you know the system that we're building strong uh, because it's this is an open table and everyone's here and everyone's experience and voice is equally important. Next slide, please. This is our agenda for today. We have some agreements, objectives, and introductions. We'll then introduce our community leaders, um, have a minute about the current housing system and the problems that we see. We'll go then into Somos Mayfair's process and vision um, to address those problems. And lastly, uh, kind of the meat of the burger to talk about the alternative system of living and equity housing and what that vision looks like for San Jose and for uh, the East Side. And then finally, we'll have a discussion at the end. Next slide, please. So these are our objectives for the session today. Number one, to center and uplift the community vision formed by Vecinos Activos. Number two, to become familiar with limited equity housing cooperatives. And number three, to recognize how limited equity housing cooperatives preserve San Jose's communities, protect against displacement, and provide dignified homes for everyone. We, I just want to point out, today is not going to be a technical deep dive on exactly how limited equity housing cooperatives function, or how they're governed, or how the money works. That is for a later workshop. We'll invite you to express interest in that workshop. <laughs> at the end of today, but just keep in mind, these are the objectives, the three objectives that we have for today's session. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, who is Somos Mayfair? Somos Mayfair builds community power in East San Jose through leadership development and by organizing around resident-led solutions. Our mission is to support children, organize families, and to connect neighbors to uplift the dreams, power, and leadership of community and address systemic inequities. Our vision is a thriving Mayfair, and Mayfair is uh, in East San Jose. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so Vecinos Activos. Vecinos Activos is a program, uh, a group of community members that organizes in Somos Mayfair. So Vecinos Activos, organizes families in Mayfair in East San Jose. Community members, including parents and children, meet to analyze the root causes of problems that infect the community. And we've advocated for a community platform for Mayfair and East San Jose. Through direct action and policy change, families are organizing to address permanent affordability, neighborhood development without displacement, and other housing solutions. I just want to say and pause for a second that Somos as almost we believe that the most powerful change, like the kind of change that liberates and humanizes all of us is really made by community members that have been the most impacted by exclusion, oppression, disinvestment and injustice. And so this is why we do the work, the way that we do the work. Um, you'll see some art pieces like the one on this slide today that came out of uh, some work with an artist that we did with uh, through Vecinos Activos with an artist named Felix Quintana to um, talk about and just show the work that we do. And so this slide here is about us working together as a community to learn, to break bread together, to dream, and to fight for change and for a better community and a better city. Next slide, please. Okay, before we introduce our community members, we want to take a brief minute to just invite you all to reflect on this question. So if you would respond in the chat, for you, what are the most important things about home? For you, what are the most important things about home? And I will just give an example. Feel free to jump in, but I'll say for me, there we go. Safety and togetherness, perfect. I don't need to give an example. Peace, security, comfort, togetherness, the freedom to be myself, family, community, serenity, and safety safe and secure, family, community, loving family, resources, relationship with neighbors, security, yes. 
the most important things about home to you? Safety and love. Freedom and the safety to be yourself. This is fantastic. Um, culture, beautiful expression. Okay, please feel free to keep giving answers in the chat. Um, I'd like now to invite us to transition. And since so much of the work that we do at Somos is community led and community driven, um, we have community members here who are gonna help facilitate today. And so I'd like to introduce you first to Rebecca Lasso. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, my name is Rebecca Lasso. I am a member of Vecinos Activos with Somos Mayfair. I have been living in San Jose for 12 years already. Uh, I graduated from San Jose State University, major in sociology and minor public administration, public policy. Uh, I, um, I've been involved with Mayfair community since 2017. As community member, I joined Vecinos Activos for two reasons. The first reason is working as a case manager at my previous job, I witnessed how many, many families fall apart due to the lack of uh, access to affordable housing. They were forced, and I will say threatened, in different ways to abandon their home for unfair, discriminative, and sin sinister policies. They did not only lose their, their, uh, a four-wall structure called house, but they also lost their entire life that, it, that has been created with a lot of effort. The second reason, I myself struggled to find an affordable and peaceful place to live. I am constantly worried about how and when I will be evicted. I would love to live in a place where I feel emotionally and physically secure. Uh, also, years ago, I was involved in funding a cooperative business as a promotora. Being part of this extraordinary group of people that I got together, that that they got together to improve their income and quality of life, I learned that cooperative organization is the key, is the best choice to achieve that desired calm dream. Uh, cooperatives allow us, allow our community to have control of our situations. Now I will hand it over to my compañera, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. My name is Olivia Ortiz, and I'm also a member of Vecinos Activos with Somos Mayfair. My family and I live in Mayfair, and we have lived in San Jose for more than 25 years. I am a small business owner of a cooperative uh, business in e San Jose called META, and it stands for Mujeres Empresarias Tomando Acción, Women Entrepreneurs Taking Action. META is a cooperative of 11 uh, women, Meta uh, focuses on the benefit of the community uh, by doing literacy development, outreach, and advocacy. This past two years, we've been working with the public health department around COVID-19. We have been doing education around COVID-19 and the vaccines. We have been doing COVID testings too. We've been going door to door, do COVID testing and also resources. As a community member, I've joined Vecinos because I've seen families, uh, friends, and the community as a whole. Uh, being affected by this housing crisis. Uh, this is what I see happening in my community. Uh, of course, displacement, people moving far away and being pushed out for our other community. Multiple families living in one house also. I wanna share a story about someone that I love dearly. Um, she is one of the Meta members, um, but sadly she had to move um, like two, two and a half hours away from here because she tried to get a, ho a house here, um, but she couldn't, you know, she couldn't, she could not even afford a rent, let alone buy one, right? Uh, she tried so hard for years to, to get a house, but there was no way for her to, to be owner at, um, of her home here in San Jose. Um, it is ridiculous that essential workers like ourselves cannot own a home 
here in San Jose. We're the backbone of the city, right? We've been displaced to places where there's hardly any jobs. Well, there's actually no jobs and hardly any resources. And sadly, this is, this is something that's happening to so many people, not just my friend, right? Um, this is why, you know, I am, I am moving vecinos. We're trying to make a change. Uh, we cannot keep being pushed out of our communities. It is not right. Um, it's not fair. It's not humane. And this is the reason that we're doing this job. Thank you. And I'll pass it out to my compañera, Maria Teresa. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Teresa Munoz. Uh, I'm a member of the community. I've been living in San Jose for most of my life. I came here when I was 14 years old. Um, I came to San Jose and I came to love San Jose. One of the reasons I love San Jose is because our community is so diverse. I have friends from all cultures. I love all kinds of food and culture. And I work 15 years as a eligibility worker for the welfare department at Santa Clara County. Uh, when I was working at the county, I was able to get all kinds of classes to help the community. Uh, I was the only member <laughs> and the one member that did all the resources at the office and they gave me the opportunity to get a resource specialist certificate from Cornell's uh, University in New York. Um, being the first in line when people apply for assistance at the county, I knew there was a crisis with housing. I was the first in hand when people needed to find a place. I knew that the waiting list for housing was over 100,000 people and they will open the list every, I think, five to 10 years. Uh, there was no help. Uh, I knew the shelters were full. There was no way we could help our, our families. Um, not only that, but when it came time to me to be sick, I, I got sick and then I started getting the stability that prevent me from paying my $2,000 apartment <laughs> that I was paying by myself. And I wasn't able to find a, a place that was cheaper uh, during the time I was sick. Um, thank God I found this little place at this RV, RV home, uh, RV park called San Jose Mobile Home and RV Park now. I've been living there since 2015. I was forced to pay $18,000 for the little RV I own when the RV wasn't even probably $2,000, but I was forced to do it in order for me to, to have a place to live and to have my son in a safe place to live and he'll continue his education. It's very important to me uh, to have an stable housing because I went through the crisis myself. I seen it firsthand, but it, most importantly, I seen it with my neighbors. The next year I moved into the mobile home park uh, my neighbors, 14 of my neighbors, 14 families received notices that they needed to sign new agreements or move out. Uh, with the help of community members, we were able to stop that. And two years later, the, the park was bought by this company called Cascade, their investors. And basically what they did, they did the same thing. Now they serve 29 families. We were able to get help from Teresa Ramos at the city of San Jose, uh, the La Foundation and Marta O'Connell, who was very nice to, to help us. Uh, th thanks to that, we were able to save 29 families, but the harassment continues. Um, you can get a notice for even a nail that is out of place um, and they wanna evict people. I wanna avoid all these because my family my neighbors, everybody's stressed and just thinking they're gonna take us out. Uh, this cooperative and this education that I've been getting from Somos with their help, I went to Somos looking for help. I was desperate to help my neighbors and thank God I found Somos and Luna and they've been educating us in how to organize and how to save our homes. I think we will benefit from a call because we'll not be, we will not be without a home, we will not be harassed. Uh, currently, um, I'm going through through some re recovery because I had a car accident. Uh, Somos has helped me a lot, but if I was paying $2,000 or more, I would not be able to make it. So it's very important for me to keep my home and to have my son in a safe place so he can finish his college career and be a community member, active community member. 
uh, and help other, other people. Thank you very much and I'll pass it on to Oscar. Gracias, Maria. Thank you, Rebecca, Oli, um, for, for your introductions. So now we're going to get into a little bit more of the details of what where these issues come from. And as, as Matt was saying earlier, we had an artist work with our community to take the time and hear what when you think about displacement, what comes to your mind? Um, and this image came from those focus group conversations, um, these images of displacement, uh, community being forced to leave over um, over a select few who have the opportunity to, to make uh, uh, money off of everyone else. And so when we start getting into more of these details of what makes or what contributes to this growing problem of housing. Um, and so we could look at, the, at these three points, we can see rent burden, uh, most, most cost burden renters are African-American and Vietnamese communities um, here um, in, in San Jose, homeowner, homeownership, you know, African-American and Latinx households uh, disproportionately low income have the lowest rates of home ownership in the city of San Jose, and that's 34 to 39%. Um, and houselessness in the city of San Jose, African-American, indigenous and Latinx uh, residents uh, make about, um, make less than 35% of the population um, here, here in the city. And of course, um, I sent over the the, the slides, a link in the slides, you should be able to find it in the chat. There's more details about that, about all this information in the in this slide, in the comment section. And so we look to the right, you can see that in 2012, we've had a, a, a bit of a, we had a, a good housing stock or affordable housing stock here in the Santa Clara County. But over time, as you can see that it actually starts progressing lesser and lesser over the years. Um, and resulting in into, into what we see now is there's not enough housing to keep our community housed in a safe, secure place. And so again, this is all in the, in the slides that you can find more details about this. And so when we start thinking, um, you'll, you'll also find the Spanish version in the slide deck there. Um, so when we start thinking about what, how is this problem growing and where, what is contributing to these, these factors, right? And we start thinking about you know, racially restrictive policies such as redlining and restrictive housing covenants that restricted people from living in certain areas of the city. Uh, and, and we start thinking about gentrification and displacement, gentrification being where disproportionately neighborhoods that were historically disproportionately disinvested are now, are now seeing investments which is forcing community out of these areas, which they've called home for 35 plus years or multi-generations have lived in these areas um, and now are being forced to leave. And so when we start thinking about, you know, these insecurities or housing insecurities, we think, how are people even affected? You know, increase of residents being evicted, increases houselessness in the neighborhoods, um, also, you know, rent burden, um, um, folks are strapped for cash to be able to pay so they're in a fixed income and can't don't have the means to pay the uh, the housing that they live in um and the list goes on and on and so we've heard this before and so what is as we know behind the beyond the housing issue it's always education you know students are disproportionately displaced and can't pay attention in school which then you know forces them to be delayed in class a uh, mental health job and commuting here from the in from, to and from the bay area for to Los Baños, for example, or neighborhood, you know, fewer opportunities in these neighborhoods. So all of these are contributing factors that derive from these policies that disproportionately affected people of color um, in these disinvested neighborhoods. And so we we did we did um, through through that process we went through this um, we created a framework to really contribute or conceptualize what makes up. Um, what makes up these these problems or how do we best explain these issues in a framework that is easily understood for 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 community and it visualizes it so when we start thinking about governance you know landowners banks corporations and elected government officials often decide what is best for residents or community resulting in silencing those affected by their decision resources are managed in a manner that ensures that the status quo continues and this is how we see, this is the current system that contributes to the growing displacement we see in the city of San Jose and beyond. And so when we start thinking about, you know, who owns these lands, who are the land, uh, who owns the land and housing and what are the benefits of uh, ownership? 
and um, profit, profits are placed as priority that benefits those who often who own the housing and land currently current housing practices chase the real estate market waiting for an increase so they can do the same and raise their rent raise their profits from their tenants and so when we start thinking about funding um how is funding how is uh, where does the money to purchase come from and where does it go you know a select few can com compete in the growing cost of real estate market either through inheritance or an educational experience that uh, prepares them for a high paying career often resulting in a wealth collected um, from the city moving elsewhere for more lucrative lucrative investments and so when we start thinking about um when we start thinking about the collective power you know collective power who who influences what happens in the neighborhood and how does the neighborhood how does the neighborhood um, benefit from the system and tenants are often restricted by policies and rules that force their families to stay in their units and prevent uh, residents from gathering together owners create these regulations consciously to avoid problems that would hurt their bottom line and we, and participation how much participation is required of residents who can participate and so tenants have little to no influence on how on the housing unit they are renting the only responsibility that they uh, that they, uh, that they have is to pay the rent on time and that's not taking consideration of you know getting sick other family burdens that come out uh, uh, unexpectedly and so putting people at risk of displacement so you know in this i'm not going to go into too much detail because i just covered this but this is a quick summary of what we what i just went over and again you can find this in the in the um the link that i i placed before um in the chat and so now i'm going to pass this over to uh rebecca to talk a little bit more about the community process Ah, gracias, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. Um, I remember two years ago, um, while the Sinos Activos started to explore COPA, a uh, Community Opportunity Purchase Act policy, we started a housing alternative committee conformed with members of the same community. This, community. this committee, in collaboration with residents, SOMOS staff, and partners organizations, embarked on a learning process to find a solution for housing inequalities. Over two years, um, we studied the routes that contribute to this problem, housing inequalities. We analyzed three main alternative options and their type of governance. We also did a democratic vote to select the best option of alternative housing that aligned with our community values. Cooperative housing honored the principal value of our community, which is to make a collective, I will say collective, again, collective decision in every matter for the best common interest within our community. We also have a retreat where we acknowledge about current successful cooperative housing in other cities where people have the joy to have it, of having a better quality of life. Um, after long meetings, hours of education, research, we came up with this vision of cooperative housing. This vision allows us to own our home and have control of our lives. You're on mute, um, Rebecca. Somebody mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this vision allows us to own our to own our home and have a control of our lives, taking a collective decision that benefits everyone in the cooperative. I see myself living in cooperative housing where I own my place, having control of every decision that affects my place and not be afraid to be evicted for any reason, for any policy that it's no favor in our community. Thank you.
And now we're going to hear a little bit more um, from Olivia. Thank you, Oscar. This is a vision of a cooperative. Um, we, wanted to have, we wanted to have access to healthy, dignified housing, and we saw that cooperatives were a good way to do it. Um, cooperatives are not just cooperatives are just and democratic. Our voice is important, and we should be able to have a say in our home. With cooperatives, you have to think in a different way. Um, it's a lot of work. I know. Uh, I've been in a cooperative business for for almost actually no, almost five years. Wow. Um, you need support for nonprofits. Um, you need trainings. You need leadership development. You know, but um, luckily we have we have all that here. It's almost Mayfair, right? Um, we just need the funds, the money, right, <laughs> and support to get uh, cooperatives housing. Uh, cooperatives are good are good for the community because you have to you have to think in a different way. You know, you can just you cannot just think about yourself, your own property, your own profit, or or what you want, right? You have to consider the whole community and the needs of everyone. You know, we can support families like my friend that I just mentioned earlier. Uh, with cooperatives, uh, you are making decisions and managing your homes together collectively. The values of a cooperative are democratic, uh, controlled by their members who actively, you know, participate in setting their policies and supporting each other. Um, in other words, um, I see cooperatives they acknowledge the human side, right? Not the profit side. Uh, I'm going to end this message with something that captures my heart every time I read this. And it's, it goes like this. Cooperatives are the only enterprise model with globally agreed principles that rest on a foundation of shared ethical values. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it out to Oscar, who was explaining a little bit more about limited equity um, housing cooperatives. Thank you, Oli. Uh, just before we take, um, we go into a little bit more of the details of the limited equity housing cooperatives, we want to take a quick poll. So we want to do a quick poll with everyone to get their understanding. So Andrea, I'm not sure because I can't see. There we go. You should, we have a you should have a pop up screen on your window um, with about four questions there. Uh, not at all, a little, fairly, very little. Um, how familiar are you with uh, housing cooperatives? So we take a couple of seconds here, waiting for folks to, to answer this question. So we have about 40, it's still going up, but 47% say a little. We have about fairly 28%. It's still going up a little bit, some other, some other numbers. Okay, so we have everyone who answered about 100 percent, 34 answered. And so from this, in order for me to share, I got to exit and bear with me. Okay, so this is this is right here. Um, this is the, uh, the results that we got from this quick poll. So we have about two, per, you know, number two, a little is what, how familiar folks are with uh, these ideas. People can see the poll now, Oscar. The oh, nice. Okay. Cool. And so with this in mind, just a quick understanding we want to get there. So we wanted to dive into what these are, what is a limited equity housing cooperative? What does it entail? So a limited equity housing cooperative is a home ownership model that enables tenants to be a part of part owners of their homes by purchasing a share and reselling their share at an affordable price. Tenants make decisions together and the homes are affordable forever. And so when we say forever, we're talking about multi-generation affordability. That's, and so to the right of this, you can see a small graph that says limited equity housing cooperatives, uh, avoid renter uh, vulnerability, stable monthly payments, long-term affordability, opportunity to build home equity and democratic control is what comes from limited equity housing cooperatives. And again, we're gonna have future sessions that really go into the details of, the, of what the process uh, and governance of a limited equity housing cooperative. Um, so when we really started thinking about, um, we think about the current system, those governance and those ideas that we just covered earlier, um, we actually, it forces us to really imagine what we want the community vision to actually be in the future. So when we think about governance and we think about these ideas, um, they, 
you know, it's similar but different in this sense. And it's different because community has more control. You know, cooperatives are are owned and controlled by their resident owners. Resident owners establish policies and rules for the cooperative that they believe are in their own best interest, both individually and as a collective or as a community. All members have equal interest in the success of the cooperative. So it's democratic in that sense that everybody has a say. And again, there's more details in the, in the slides. And so when we start thinking of, when we start reimagining re ownership, well, each resident owner is a shareholder in the housing cooperative. As part of your membership in the cooperative, you have an executive exclusive right to live in a specific unit for as long as you want, as long as you adhere to the cooperative rules and regulations. So lands, uh, shared stewardship of the property or land. And we start thinking about funding and resident owners actively contribute to the regenerative development of their neighborhood by preventing the wealth of the community from being extracted elsewhere. And when we start thinking about collective, when we start thinking about collective power, resident owners have the ability to empower neighborhood where they have the housing cooperative reside by increasing collective voice towards projects that will amplify the necessities of the greater neighborhood. and participation in the collective, in the cooperative. Resident owners participate by taking on different responsibility in the housing cooperative. The most important role is role every resident owner holds is to vote on issues that come before the collective for a decision, going back to the democratic process of a cooperative. And when we start thinking reimagining, again, there's more information in the, in the, in the presentation that really go into the details that I just covered. Um, but this is just a quick summary of what we covered and how we want to reimagine our communities. And so with this in mind, um, there, is a, there is a member, Maria, who is work, or Maria Munoz, who is working on her RV park to share a little bit more of what her experience is, uh, what her learning process has been so far. Maria? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, I live in this park, like I mentioned before, since 2015. Uh, since we started having problems, we started organizing. And then unfortunately the pandemic hit. And also we have a lot of problems because management in our mobile home park uh, has been telling people that if they get together, if we have meetings, they're gonna be get evicted. So obviously it's been a little push and a little, uh, people are a little afraid to go to the meetings, but uh, Little by little, because what it's going on and how the crisis uh, of homes are going in San Jose, they're joining us. Um, we have been we've been getting education from Somos Mayfair. I am part of the Vecinos Activos, and I participated in the Comité de Viviendas Alternativas. It was very interesting to know that there are co-ops that can function that they can meet a lot of our needs. Uh, a lot of my neighbors, we're a very tight community. We like, like we like plants. Um, in the park where we live, um, we were told that some of the neighbors were told that we cannot have plants in, in our home. So creating this cooperative will help us develop a community, a tight community that will bring resources, um, outside resources like help for COVID, assistance with the rent, resources not only that but also we learned that we were able to keep and resolve problems as the group uh, all the education we've been getting at somos is helping us uh, see this vision and, and fulfill our dream to have a, a stable home and not be back there every single day uh, we attended a conference in sacramento uh, with some of my neighbors it was fantastic to know that there is funds that is possible. And with the education we got at Somos, we knew it was possible, but now we know there is funds. Um, and we were able to meet people that have copes already. We know there was a recent cope that was created here in another mobile home park in San Jose because of the risk of getting evicted. Um, we also met people from Salinas. They own a co-op, a housing co-op called Santa Elena. 
uh, in Soledad, California, near Salinas. They were telling us how wonderful it is to live in their community, how peaceful it is. They keep it clean. Uh, they have the resources to get maintenance, which we don't have. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a letter from the owner they didn't in 2015 saying they call it an RV park. It's just the least that they can call our park. Um, and you can see the difference. You see a little old RV that it's probably 30 years old next to a tiny home. And the difference in the rent is huge. If you live in an RV, you pay about $700 for the space. But if you live in this tiny little tiny home, you pay $1,800. Uh, we want to actually be able to live without paying that much because we will not be able to afford it. Uh, we were invited to Soledad and very soon we're going to do a field trip to Soledad with the tank of Somos and Luna. So we'll be able to get the steps and step by step with the help of, of Somos and all the professionals that are helping us to fulfill this dream of having our homes. So our neighbors, are joining in and many more will join in probably in the future, but many of them are afraid and I don't blame them. So I will invite you to look into this and to help us make this dream come true. We can possibly do it. We have everything we can to do it. Thank you so very much. And I'll pass it on to Matt. Thank you, Maria. Um... I think I'm just really <laughs> reflecting on, you know, I've been in a lot of these conversations. I know everyone who's spoken today fairly well. And every time I feel inspired by the work um, and the vision, it just, it feels really strong. And I know there's a lot of work to do, but um, it's just, I don't know. I feel like it's beautiful and it's powerful and, and it's really captivating and compelling. Um, and this is why we're doing it here at Somos. And so I, Oscar, if you would go ahead and share the next slide. Um, I wanna say a few words about what it's gonna take to get there. <clears throat> and then we'll have a, a discussion and we, we actually have extra time for discussion. So I hope there's questions. I hope there's <laughs> thoughts and feelings that, that folks wanna share. Um, I did wanna share that, you know, so, so there's this vision, right? And we're imagining, we didn't share all the details, but um, folks have imagined that grand, you know, when grandkids are growing up, there will be hundreds or thousands of homes that are cooperatively owned and managed in East San Jose. Um, it's, it's, it's gonna take a lot of work to get there, but um, it's work that's been done. And it's work that, that, I mean, you see the poll that we shared earlier, there's already a lot of folks in this room who are familiar with co-ops and who know how co-ops work. Um, in the United States, there have been over 425,000 limited equity co-op units that have been created. They're not all still there, but that's a lot of people. That's like potentially millions of people who have lived in, co in limited equity co-op housing in this country. In California, right now, there's almost 12,000 homes that are in limited equity housing co-ops. Again, that's a lot of people across more than 110 cooperative, um, you know, LEHCs, like buildings. So um, the wisdom is out there and the connections and the resources and training is, is out there. Um, can you imagine like that's, that's probably right now hundreds of thousands of people living cooperatively in housing that's built on principles like democratic member control, member economic participation, autonomy, independence, um, a value for training and learning and information, collaboration among and between cooperatives, which is something we're really gonna need uh, to, to, to have this vision become reality in the East Side. And also just uh, governed by a concern for the community over, over any other objective, including profits, right? Number one is a concern for community. Um, in San Jose, we actually have two limited equity housing co-ops over on Capitol Avenue. And there's about almost 300 homes um, in those co-ops combined. I don't think anybody here today lives there, but um, they're over there on Capitol Avenue. Uh, it's just co-op housing is not something that's very common in San Jose. 
and not something that a lot of folks really know about or that policies really support very well at this point. And so um, all that to say, it's gonna take a lot of work and partnership for us all to get there together. So um, we just wanted to highlight three things that we really need in order to uh, build out this vision. Number one, we need supportive policies. We need supportive policies like the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, which levels the playing field so that community ownership can compete in the market with investors that just have tons of cash and can make all cash offers you know, overnight. Um, if, community, if community preservation is really a priority for us, then we need policies that reflect that you know, and put anti-displacement as the most important thing. So COPA, for example, would give qualified nonprofits and tenants the tools that they need to buy rental housing, like Maria Teresa's mobile home park or like West Winds mobile home park, which has over 700 units up in North San Jose. And they're trying to form a co-op right now. Um, the tools they need to buy rentals when they go up for sale and convert it to cooperative ownership. The second thing that we need is capacity building. All this work cannot be sustained without strong community-based organizations that can help organize tenants, train and support and provide technical assistance to residents. That's like um, talking with residents who are in a situation that might eventually want to form a co-op. That's talking to residents when buildings go up for sale. That's you know having connections to funding and other things that can support the transition from extractive um, market-based rental housing into limited equity cooperative housing. So we really need a prioritization of the community organizations that carry out this work. And finally, um, we need a commitment to preservation as an affordable housing strategy. We know that affordable housing production is important. We know that um, tenant protections are also really important, but we can't do this without a commitment to preservation of existing housing. Um, which is also a community preservation strategy, which is also an anti-displacement strategy. That means our funding, our affordable housing funding and policy language needs to include language around cooperative housing, community land trust, and other um, community ownership models that uh, can have access to that funding to, to acquire and rehabilitate housing to improve it and, and you know, make the transition into this kind of housing that, we, that we're talking about. Of course, um, an umbrella over all of this is that we just need to keep learning, right? With workshops like this um, on our own, right? Somos Mayfair is committed to doing a lot more education around cooperative housing. And so we recognize that um, just in general, in San Jose, we have a lot of learning to do and that's okay. If we believe that this is important, then we'll make it work. You know, we'll, we will keep learning and we'll provide the connections and the, and the training um, to build this out. We're committed to it. Okay. So with that, um, we would like to have some time for a discussion. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. You, I'm gonna say you can also raise your hand and we can take live questions too, if you like. So question or clarification, or if you just wanna say, I love this, <laughs> you can say that too. Carmen, go ahead. I love this. So I'm here. <laughs> um, no, I really truly do. I think this is fantastic. Um, so I know that not a lot of folks at the elected legislative level here in San Jose, really many of them don't support this type of housing option. So how, how do we see getting more of them engaged in this? And especially since we have an election coming up, and we're gonna have some new folks coming in or we're gonna have some, switch, some switching around of um, individuals, how can we ensure that we really make it at their forefront that this is how critical this is for the community. Thank you, Carmen. That's a great question. Um, 
Andrea, do you want to? Okay, I can take a. I can take a. <laughs> um, it's it's just it's a lot of constant communication. You know, Carmen, there are um, there's a lot of places of engagement with policies that exist already, um, like the housing element, like the city budgeting process, like our COPA advocacy, and those are all opportunities to engage with council members and council offices around these policies. And so it's really, um, part of it is just paying attention. And I think we're doing a good job with this with the COPA coalition, is just trying to um, hold all of those opportunities. And um, this is where partnership is really important, right? Because you know, SP at Home or Luna or the land or South Bay Community Land Trust, uh, working partnerships and other folks that are committed to this, you know, to this vision, have different, um, you know, policy priorities that they're really advocating for. And so we we have a table where we discuss these things, and then we say we make invitations to each other. Oh, okay, this council member is really open to writing a memo or championing this policy. Let's come together and like do what we got to do to like move on that. You know, so I think the partnership and utilizing those relationships that exist um, is part of it. The other part of it uh, is with city staff. And I'm so happy that we have uh, county staff here today. There's a lot of county staff in the room today uh, from the Office of Supportive Housing, or at least that RSVP. I haven't seen the list. Um, but it, yeah, it just like it's really great to, to find um, the, the city and county staff that are open to having these conversations and open to learning. And then we do education, we have conversations. Um, and we invite folks to things like this where we can learn together, right? So those are, those are just some thoughts that I have. Can I add something? Yes. Uh, well, Matt already said it, I said education. Uh, I believe that most people who is opposed to this type of policies or this type of project because they don't know, right? Or they're just hear something or, um, or they're confused or it's no more interest, what interests them, but it's education to tell me how it not just benefit to the community, but how it would benefit to them as well as a council part of um, the project or what they, they, they had their plans and for, for that year so we'll say education to to see what is this how it is to them so they having the time with us to educate them about all these great projects we're trying to do here that's great thank you rebecca let me read back i think there's a few comments and questions in the chat um Victor says, like Olivia mentioned, we also need funding to purchase properties and hand over the keys to tenants. Yes. Julie asks, what sort of pushback do you regularly get from city folks that have decision-making and policy power? Who would like that question? Uh, I'm, uh, I don't live anywhere near you, but I read the book Evicted. Has anybody here read that? And I learned through that book that uh, renting has become a big business. It's a part of capitalism now. A uh, hundred years ago, somebody would rent out a couple houses, but now people rent many, many houses, and that's how they make their money. And one of the points the book made was, uh, there was, it's all about Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is that this uh, mobile home park was owned by a lady who was making $425,000 a month off of her uh, renters. Now, how do you convince people making that much money to change their regulations and allow a co-op? people are greedy and they don't want to have a co-op. So this is a very, very difficult change. And how do you change people who, who are making a lot of money? That's what our culture is. Everything has a monetary value. Good 
Gail, thank you. Um, you're right. I think this is exactly the kind of extractive housing system that we recognize and that we're trying to change. And really, it's almost at least what we believe is that we have to create a new system. We can't operate within the the rules right. of the existing system because, you're, as you said, it's set up in the way that it's set up, um, and it's not working for for our community, right? Um, Thank you also for uh, calling out evicted. If anybody else has great resources that feel relevant for this conversation, go ahead and drop those in the chat too. Um, there's a lot of good learning. And as we said at the beginning, there's a wisdom in this room that we have and we can share with each other. It's not just the five people that spoke on the Zoom. <laughs> um, can I say a comment to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is hard to convince the rich people telling them, okay, you will not receive your money for next month. However, there is also true that we need to learn, um, acknowledge and have it present every single day. Our current society, how it is, there is no middle class anymore. It is just high class, upper class, but the low income class are the majority of, our, of this country. The good thing of this country, is voting, voting, right? Taking decision and participate in that decision. And we can change that. Sometimes because of we are, you know, busy in everyday life with many responsibilities, we don't think about the little power to maybe the little power we have voting, but that's our also Somos Mayfair and I believe other organization working to um, make aware our community. If we get together, we can do it. It's gonna be difficult, it's not gonna be easy, but low-income people have been struggling for years, year one, and we're still here struggling and making changes, and cooperative housing is the key. Cooperative, working cooperative, not just to own your home, but learning and create those values where you can share you can say no in this time, no, no, what I wanted. Okay, now I, I will get what I want. You know, those kind of co co cooperation. So it's gonna be difficult, but I believe still we have that power and in, in us to, to change all this um, new um, system, well, this system we have. Yeah, I agree. And I think some of you should run for office because you not only need to vote, but you need to run for office. Oli, can you share about the, right. the, the cowboy that we met at the conference? Yes, um, well, I was going back to uh, Julie's question and, and echoing Gail, right? I feel like, um, unfortunately, we're in the point that money has been, is more important than than the well-being of a human, you know, unfortunately. And I feel like, um, I'm pretty honest, I feel like there's a lot of, uh, there is some pushback at city level, right? Cause we have engaged, you know, a city level. And, um, and the reason is because I feel like they, you know, people that the benefit, you know, from, from renting for investing, you know, they're so involved with those people that are making decisions. And like Rebecca said, right, we have to, we have to get involved, like our, our power that we have is voting and we have to, we have to make them, hold them accountable, right, they have to be held accountable because of they have, what they have, decisions they have to make, the decisions that they have, um, they have make is not, uh, led us to this, to be honest, you know, they have, the, the decisions that make for years and years, uh, led us to the decisions we have right now, so we have to make them hold accountable, we have to be more active on knowing what, knowing what decisions are those council members are making, what are they voting on, you know, what are they supporting on? Because some of them, I'm gonna have to say it, you know, personally, I have to say that they're not really with our people, with our community. They're more with the, with the people that is making the money, unfortunately. And we're fighting this big giant, but I do believe and I hope that we are gonna, we're gonna get over this and we're gonna have, you know, housing for all, dignified housing for all. I do believe that but we have to do this all together. And going with what Matt has said that we went to um, to this conference, um, we met this, uh, we met, I forget his name, what was his name, sorry. 
he owns, he's starting a cooperative with farmers, farmers cooperative, right? But he, he, he's been an organizing. He's, he's have seen what's going on and what, what, you know, because of what um, people that have the power, they, uh, they don't support a community. So he run for council member, Half Moon Bay. So he's a, he's a council member and he's starting a co-op and he has a co-op as a farmers. So when I heard from him, I was like, oh my God, I was just so enlightened by him. So, so like they all say, you know, we have to, you know, we have to take those spaces. If they're not, you know, if they're not, if uh, people that are taking, have the power to make decisions, they're not, they're not making this to benefit us. We have to, we have to be in those, in those places, right? And we have to definitely hold them accountable. That's right, Oli. Um, I, I say the final thing to answer your question, Julie, that I thought about is just we, we get a lot of, um, oh, you know, we're nervous. We don't want to try something new. Like, I think uh, certain folks are reluctant to give money to the South Bay Community Land Trust, for example, just because of, you know, track record and it's a newer organization, and which to us feels like a racial justice issue. Um, you know, I understand that that there is something to be said for like technical experience and things like that. But to be honest, how many white folks over the years have been given that uh, chance, right? By banks, by cities and city programs. Um, and so I, we don't really accept that excuse. And which is why we continue to advocate and continue to, to, to push for um, support and funding for these models, even when it seems like a risk, right? COPA seems like a risk. Funding a CLT or a co-op seems like a risk for the city, but we got to start somewhere, right? We can't get that experience if we don't get started. So this is why we, we do conversations like this <laughs> and we advocate and we build, you know, we build partnership and we build movement because it's about messaging and it's about the movement. And Matt, like one, add, one thing to add to that, Matt, is I think it's really important for for folks like here on this on, on this work in this workshop or attending this workshops or other community members to really get involved in, in projects like this or initiatives like this is because your presence matters. You know, we can't do all this work alone. Education is important. Advocacy doesn't only happen in city hall, but it also happens, you know, in a grocery store in different areas of our daily lives. And that's where this information is really it really does its work in educating folks who may not see other opportunities because these models are not talked about. They're not taught in sc schools or not talked about at work or they're, you know, they're not really known because it's, it's difficult to find this information. So now that this information is kind of coming to light through this process, it's really important for folks to share that information and share these different ideas um, because we do need that support in city hall or in state or federal, but we also do that. We do need that support and down, down in grassroots organizing because that's what really shifts um, what is going on in these policies to get that support and to try to try something different and to allow us to, you know, kind of shift away from the same issues we keep hearing and really being able to say, okay, look, we finally fixed this issue. Now let's focus focus on other issues um, and to continue that our growth in, in, in a positive way with you know with community at the table um, and being able to to close that loop which folks are, are falling through right now. So it's Carmen, I'll chime in a little bit more. I do agree with what you just said, um, Oscar, in the fact that we have to get to that grassroots level of um, connecting with community-based organizations that are that don't look like us, the ones that have those powers, we have to get into their space and start educating them because I to your point that you made earlier Rebecca this is so important that they understand just how bad I don't think a lot of them understand how bad the situation is and I don't think they also don't understand what this type of housing option is all about they they've heard a lot of things about it but I don't think they've really gotten into the to the root of it to really understand how it works and the one thing that gives me hope, and hopefully it gives everybody else here hope too, was what Chris Smalls did with Amazon. <laughs> I'm like, he did that with Amazon. We can do that here. We can bring about that change. Um, and you know, Amazon was something that everybody thought it couldn't happen and he made it happen. So that gives me hope. And that's why I'm so excited to be part of this stuff because 
Um, there's absolutely, I've been here a long time. I've been a long time resident of San Jose. I've been here since the eighties and it just has become worse and worse and worse and worse. And that is just not what I signed up for when I came to live here. So I do want to see this get better. And I, I truly appreciate these opportunities and I'm glad we're engaged because prior to this, I was not. So I'm very, very happy to be engaged in this process. So thank you. And we're really grateful to have you with us, Carmen. Yeah, it's been great to work together over the last several months. Um, I wanna call some other comments out of the chat. Jaime is asking if we have uh, count of votes at City Council and Board of Soups. The City Council for COPA, um, we're working on it. The vote's not gonna be till later in the fall. And so there's some people who are, need to be you know, kept up with over that whole time, especially during the multiple phases of election season. The Board of Soups, we don't have anything to vote on right now. Although as Victor put in the chat, the county or Kenneth put it in the chat, uh, the county is actually launching a co-op pilot next soon, which there's an event about next Monday. So if you're curious about that, um, I have signed up. I'm very curious about this event. Kenneth put the link in the chat already. Uh, it's a little bit further up. So I would encourage you, uh, Jaime or anybody else who's interested in what the county is doing with co-op housing to go to that event next Monday, if you can. Victor says the county is exploring co-op housing. Yep. Um, the county has also supported piloting early education co-ops as well. So not just about housing, but other types of cooperatives, right? Like we said, co-ops support co-ops. Um, it is a whole ecosystem that's that's very interconnected with outside of housing and inside of housing. Cooperative solutions overall, yeah. Um, Julie is asking again, Are you, she's curious if we have conversations about the effect of car dependency on housing affordability. Oh boy, <laughs> that's a big planning question. Um, we do have some of those conversations. I think um, those are kind of within the conversation of just ecological well-being and stewardship of land and, and housing and the earth. And it's a complicated conversation because we know right now that the city is just built for cars, unfortunately. Um, and I know Jaime and Aruva have had a lot of debates on this um, about, you know, we, we want uh, sustainable transit um, and yet it's gonna take a while to get there. So what do we do in the meantime? It is a, how do we transition in a just and sustainable way? Um, yes, Julie, we have those conversations. <laughs> Victor says the market is designed to sell, so land and housing owners will sell. We need the money and systems to buy those properties so we can take those housing units off their hands, turn them into co-ops and preserve them for beyond a lifetime. The first group will pay the price, but long-term generations will benefit. Um, and paying the price, we're, we're hoping that um, the city and the county pays the price. And so it is a, it is a long-term generational investment. So that's what we expect. Yep, yep. Um, and Natalie's saying here at the end, yes, the county's workshop is focused on the technical details of how you finance and develop co-ops. Great. So it's a great follow-up to, uh, to this education session. It's geared toward developers. But I think you're all smart people and you can hang with it. <laughs> this is part of learning, right? You learn even when it's hard. Um, we have a few more minutes for questions. Is anybody who hasn't spoken or asked a question yet um, would like to say anything or ask a question or just tell us how you're feeling about all this? If you're awake still, here's some thumbs up. <laughs> Tiffany's in the house. Thank you, Tiffany. I just want to add something, and I want to say that it's very hard to fight against the system. But like Kenneth said, we want to remain home. We want to stay in San Jose. We want to be productive members um, of our community. Our kids are going to go, grow up to uh, become probably members of the community and well-educated, uh, the opportunities we didn't have. So a lot of people in my neighborhood in my little mobile home RV park, most of the kids go to college and they will not be able to do it without, you know, paying 
the little rent we pay. Um, but yes, we want to remain home. We want to stay home and si se puede. Thank you. Si se puede. Thank you, Maria. And Kenneth, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, just kind of um, piggybacking on, you know, like you were saying how cooperatives are uh, an ecosystem and, you know, just thinking like, for example, um, I have a friend, Elizabeth Sarmiento, who started uh, Smart Yards Co-op and she, you know, she works with uh, a bunch of folks to, um, to have, um, you know, sustainable landscaping, gray water systems and things like that for front yards, backyards. And it's just like, yeah, like, how do we think about how do we like work with other co-ops as we like, for example, build our housing co-ops. Um, how, how do we, you know, tap into the existing ecosystem? And I know like, I know I think a slice in New York is also a, a co-op and, you know, how do we learn from them from, you know, uh, you know, from, from kind of like their, their challenges and what do they recommend and et cetera. So just wanted to throw that out there. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. Uh, Victor says we need a South Bay co-op conference to learn and organize together. Ooh, I think Victor's volunteering to organize that. All right, thank you, Victor. <laughs> okay, um, we have a few a few closing comments, and hopefully we'll get y'all out of here a few minutes early, so you can take a break before your two o'clock meeting. Um, Oscar, if you would go ahead and share the screen again. Okay, so we have just a brief little survey. It's it's three short questions. Um, we would love to hear a little bit of feedback from y'all about today's uh, event, the webinar, how you're feeling. So Andrea, can you launch the survey? There we go. And we'll give you a few minutes and wait until um, we can actually see when everybody's participated. So. Oscar, you want to throw on some music for like a minute and a half? Yeah, give me a second. Um, I don't, one sec. And then after the survey, we do have a couple invitations. So don't jump off just yet. If you can hang around for just a few more minutes. Let me know if it's too loud. Sure. We need to end a and a cure. Because do you really think mom got a problem with your Imagine if every problem was alive and current days are meant you and I. You think that with you like you and I do all this and contemplate all right, we live this way. Lots of events on there. Yep. Uh, until the end of the meeting. And so you can you keep on uh, typing comments into there. But if we'll go to the next slide, Oscar, we have a few invitations for everyone here today. Um, how can you stay involved? I think there's a lot of good energy from this conversation today and we wanna keep it moving um, because it, you know, it takes a lot of momentum and partnership to, to make this work happen. Um, one way you can join in is by learning more about COPA. We have a website right there, somosmefer.org slash COPA that hopefully Juan can put that link in the chat for us. So you can just click it. There's a lot of good info about what is the COPA policy? What are we advocating for? You can sign the petition. You can see videos from community member testimonials um, and just plug into the movement. We're gonna be doing a lot of actions this summer leading up to the vote in the fall. So 
That's a good way to plug in. Number two, you can keep learning about limited equity co-ops. Um, we have uh, the California Center for Co-op Development is out in Sacramento. They've been a great resource for us. They have a lot of information and resources about housing co-ops and all kinds of co-ops. So if you go on their website, which we've put on the slide here, you can keep learning on your own. <clears throat> um, and lastly, we have an invitation. If you would like to stay involved with SOMOS, with this co-op conversation, we will be doing more events later on this year, more learning. We're always gonna keep learning. Um, if you wanna stay connected, just put a one in the chat and we'll, we'll find your email address and we'll follow up with you after the, after the event. Esto es para los nuevos, ¿verdad? Was Lucy's question for us? Sí, digo que si esto es para este mensaje es para los nuevos. Sí, sí, para los nuevos. Sí. Okay, okay. You're already in. <laughs> sí, gracias. Does anybody feel pumped up and ready to uh, lead our Unity Clap? Who hasn't, maybe who hasn't tried it before? I know it's a big ask, but we have the script on the slide. So you just have to read. Unity Clap going once, going twice. Kenneth, you wanna go for it? Sure. Yeah, right. Want me to start? Go for it. All right, I'm gonna go with the, the beat of my heart then. Let me, let me, let me get a pulse check real quick. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. Si se puede. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hasta Thank you luego. Bye. Hasta luego. Bye. 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 Bye.